Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street from Main Street. And this is Lee Justo from Risk. Welcome back to another episode of Finance Unspun. This is episode number nine. Can't believe we're already at episode number nine, Lee. I know we've been cranking these out when we can. I, I just one thing I want to mention is uh, I did launch a new video on my um, YouTube channel just tonight. So I hope everyone can go visit that. So it, it's been interesting times in Europe and it's kind of starting to spill over into the rest of the world. Right, Jason? Yeah, the, the energy crisis is causing enormous amounts of problems in Europe. But the problems in Europe, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, they've been happening for many, many years underneath the surface. But the energy crisis is really exacerbating problems that were already there in the European Union with government debt, with European companies. I actually got in an argument, I think, with a hedge fund manager. Or the guy seemed to be a financial professional because he was literally just quoting right off a of Bloomberg terminal, talking about how much better shape European companies were in compared to U.S. companies. Well, Lee, if you go back before uh, 2019 and 2020, there were actually an enormous amount of problems with European companies, with large European banks and European government debt that was papered over by the European Central Bank and with help from the Federal Reserve Bank via these US dollar currency swap lines that were supposed to actually have ended in 2010. That was the Fed's official stance. They were only temporary in 2008 and 2009. They ended in 2010. I found proof that that was not the case, that trillions of dollars in these currency swap lines were drawn by the European Central Bank in 2011, 2013, 2014, 15, 16, 17, and then 2019 with the repo madness crisis and early 2020, even more, many, many trillions problems with these large European banks and others. So there was a lot of bailouts, uh, secret bailouts. The European Central Bank Lee actually did, and a lot of people are not aware of this, on a percentage basis, especially relative to GDP and growth in their balance sheet, they actually did larger amounts of quantitative easing than the Federal Reserve Bank did from 2009 to 2019. So do you think that we're reaching the point where the chickens are coming home to roost with with all this quantitative easing that's been going on for some time now? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, there was a lot more inflation added to the system that got into consumer prices and it's wreaking havoc with consumers. And you're starting to see that with bad earnings with these companies, with the Q2 numbers. And then we had the, the warnings with FedEx for Q3. I mean, FedEx put out a warning to try to cover themselves, but it actually backfired and now it's spooking the market even more. And then now we're recording this episode on Sunday night, September 18th, 2022. So the Fed rate hikes are looking at coming down uh, this week. A lot of the projections are at least 75 basis point rate hikes, but I've seen projections of potentially 100 basis points we're yep. going to see. But the dollar index, Lee, is are hovering around 110. Europe, the European Union, is a mess for a bunch of different reasons. They have inflation, the energy problem. It is just a disaster out there, a really bad bear market, stagflation, the energy crisis in Europe, higher energy and electricity prices, but stagflation, the monetary supply going nuts with all these different countries the last two and a half years. It wasn't just the Federal Reserve Bank with all this inflation that was created in the system, wreaking havoc with companies, consumers, discretionary income and savings. Well, you know, getting back to the ECB, they actually raised the 75 basis points and that was their largest increase ever. And their ECB president, Christine Lagarde, blamed the increase on the August um, Inflation numbers, which I believe it was nine point one percent, and you know they're they're very um, focused on getting that back to a two percent increase, which, from my view, I, I think is impossible at this point. They can hike rates all they want. They still have a bunch of zombie companies or bankrupt companies. There's talks. Uh, they've already talked about putting caps, which I think is stupid. It's not going to fix the supply problems with no, their with their not. energy and electricity. Yeah. Putting caps on prices is dumb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that just for basic economics 101, you put a, a price cap on something, it does not fix supply and demand. And in fact, will create more rationing, more shortages, because the investments are not being made into the supply side, more supply will reduce the price, not putting a cap on the price. Oh, of course, is of course. And, you know, the German government's um, looking at bailing out the energy company and they're, they're going to You mean throw... the manufacturers or their energy companies? No, they're the energy supplying company. 
you know, they're they're, like they're, they're, gonna, they're gonna probably have to bail out manufacturers too, because I mean these manufacturers. Oh yeah, no awesome. doubt about it. They're shutting down because they can't produce anything because there's no the energy cost is so high. They they just they just can't the smelters there everything any any high energy use industry any manufacturing it, it's just they're getting squeezed on energy costs uh, you know and and there's also talks of um, Germany nationalizing their uh, energy suppliers so. Yeah, so more anti-free market, more exactly. anti-capitalism solutions. I'm sure the politicians, bureaucrats, regulators, the uh, the professors, the academics, they will blame capitalism. They will blame free markets. Yep. But this is a problem with government, bad policy, bad rules, bad regulations. You've had bad energy policy in the European Union for well over a decade now, and it has compounded. So there was malinvestment. There was bad investment into green energy, Absolutely. solar, wind, yep. biofuels, instead of setting up liquefied natural gas import facilities instead of allowing oil and natural gas drilling more responsibly. In a lot of the landmass of the European Union, it's not even allowed. I mean, Norway, I think, is increasing their oil and natural gas production. The North Sea, which used to be one of the main areas mm -hmm. for oil and natural gas production in the European Union, or well, right outside of um, British waters there. Uh, that's the North declining. Sea crude. Well, you have a decline. I think the production is declining rapidly. So mm -hmm. I think Royal Dutch Shell, uh, BP, and others said that the even if they invested tens of billions in capital there, that the North Sea is going to be declining rapidly. So there's still very big supply side problems. The other point I wanted to talk about with the European Union, I want to plug my buddy Daniel Lacaille. I've interviewed him over the years. He's a if you're not familiar with him, he's a hedge fund manager in the in the European Union and London. He's worked out of Europe for many, many years. He also writes articles for the Mises Institute. Mm -hmm. And he was writing articles Lee, for years for the Mises Institute for free about all the problems in the European Union with zombie companies, with bailouts. The European Central Bank at one point was buying all this corporate debt, was saving European governments, was buying all this uh, government debt. And hedge fund managers and portfolio managers at these investment banks knew the European Central Bank was going to buy all this garbage and they were front running it on leverage for extra profits. <laughs> there was actually there was actually a research report cited in one of Daniel Lacaille's 2017 articles for the Mises Institute talking about European Union zombie companies. I think over 30 percent, according to the research report of European Union companies, these are small and medium sized businesses, were already insolvent back in 2017. Uh, that that's that's like shocking but not 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 surprising if that well, makes sense and, but my point though is that the european central bank and then via currency swap lines from the federal reserve bank was already doing all these covert bailouts to save large european banks to save european corporations not every single european corporation but there was a lot of hidden bailouts the european union we were talking about this before we started recording. In general, I think the the idea of the United States of Europe was a really, really bad idea by the globalists and the Davos crowd and the U.S. military, the U.S. intelligence agencies, and the U.S. State Department. So it was a really bad idea for a bunch of different reasons. They had, what, a unified currency with the euro, but then they uh -huh. didn't have, what, unified bond markets. I think Martin Armstrong has talked about this and that the euro from the beginning was uh, was designed in a faulty way. No, of course. I, I remember when they were talking about the euro and they were they were coming out with it. Uh, it was supposed to be backed by gold, uh, a certain percentage of that, and that that talk just quickly faded away. And then they started with insane amounts of quantitative easing on a percentage basis after two thousand eight, two thousand nine financial crisis. I mean, what we know with the real bailout numbers in 2008, 2009, the European Union, especially the large banks in the European Union, like Deutsche Bank and many others, they collapsed and things only got worse for the large European banks with all the problems with um, with Greece, with the Greek debt, and you had MF Global blowing up and so many hedge funds that were leveraged with Greek debt on the wrong side of trade, those blew up. You had currency problems and bond market problems with the pigs, which is Port Portugal, Italy, Ireland, Greece, and Spain. Mm -hmm. And then there was a lot of bad leveraged currency trades with Brexit. So there were hidden bank bailouts all, all along the way there. The European Central Bank and then the Federal Reserve Bank secretly were all involved in covering this up to pretend that the European Union was doing okay, that there wasn't all of these zombie companies that hidden bank bailouts along the way from 2009 to 2019. And in the, the bailouts that we found out from, from the New York Fed disclosures, Lee, 
with European banks in the repo madness crisis in 2019 and in early 2020 are absolutely insane. A lot of these large European banks, again, basically failed, had derivatives failures again in 2019 and 2020. I think at one point, Lee, from uh, 2009 to 2019, talking about how the European Central Bank did a larger amount of QE on a percentage basis of GDP than the Fed, I think the amount of QE was up to around 40% of their GDP. So I think they were actually the highest. So as much as the crazy stuff as the Bank of Japan has done, the Federal Reserve Bank has done, I think at one point from 2009 to 2019, the European Central Bank did more. Wow. Unbelievable. And and they've hidden it pretty well, I think. So, you know, let, let's talk... Um, Let's talk a little bit about what's going on with the Fed um, and, and what you think is going to happen. I mean, I I read that uh, Vanguard is uh, projecting a 65% chance of recession next year. They agree with you. They, they think uh, 75 to 100 base points is coming. Um, it's, it's kind of uh, to be expected with the inflation we've been experiencing, but I think it's starting to really have a bite on the economy. And I, I think the, the FedEx warning really illustrates that. I don't think the Fed has any good options left. So I think the Fed, it thinks that they can maintain credibility with a lot of regular people, regular business people, regular Wall Street people mm -hmm. by continuing to raise interest rates, continuing to claim that they're going to fight inflation. The reality is, Lee, the more they raise interest rates, the more likely they are to crash home prices. So they're going to break things in ways that once things really start to break. So we have as bad as the bear market is right now, Lee. We have not had a full crash in real estate like we had 2007, 2008. So if the U.S. has that, you're looking at a lot of states and local governments here in the U.S. Their finances are precarious. So you're looking at potentially income tax revenues, capital gains taxes, property taxes, six to nine months after home prices and other asset prices crash if the Fed keeps hiking rates. You're looking at the Fed needing to go in and bail those entities out. And this is while the Fed claims, Lee, right now with the quantitative tightening, the Fed calls it quantitative tightening. In English, if you want to simplify it, it just means they're claiming that they're going to reduce their balance sheet. The Fed hasn't really reduced their official balance sheet yet. They're supposed to be reducing their official balance sheet, I think, by $90 billion per month. And I think in the next couple of weeks, they're supposed to increase that to $95 billion per month. They're supposed to reduce their balance sheet but we're already, and we saw evidence of this in the last week or two, Lee, the U.S. Treasury auctions are faltering. Where's the demand? Who's going to buy the Treasuries then if the Fed is supposed to be selling the Treasuries? If foreigners are not running trade surpluses and recycling their foreign exchange reserves and their trade surpluses back into U.S. Treasuries, who's going to buy the Treasury then? Yeah. Yeah. And if the economy falters even more, I think that's going to be uh, even less demand globally well, for... <laughs> Well, I'll tell you who's going to buy the treasuries then. And it you can't prove or disprove this because they're, the not Fed. Gonna, they're not going to allow real Fed audits. The Fed is putting tens of billions per week off balance sheet into special purpose vehicles. It, you know, when you, when you actually take a step back from this, Jason, you think about it, the Fed's calling causing all these economic woes. They cause the bubbles by artificially depressed interest rates. Then the bubbles pop, and and they 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 buy more. I mean, it's just it's just crazy. I mean, it's so non capitalist. It's just I don't know. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Oh, I agree. I agree. But the U.S. Treasury their their annual tax receipts have become increasingly more reliant on capital gains taxes on stocks, bonds, and real estate over the last couple of decades. So it went Lee. I want to say about 20 years ago, 20 25 years ago, it went from about 10 percent. It had never been higher than 10% of their annual tax receipts for capital gains taxes on stocks, bonds, and real estate, which meant that the majority of the Fed's annual tax receipts came from income tax from the real economy. So that's real products and services, businesses actually growing, actually investing, the real economy benefiting, right? And uh -huh. that has changed with financialization, quantitative easing, the Fed publicly saying wealth effect. And so as the Fed publicly announced wealth effect, asset price inflation, the Cantillon effect increasing to orders of magnitude higher, the annual tax receipts for the U.S. federal government, the U.S. Treasury, became even more reliant on capital gains taxes for stocks, bonds, and real estate to here we are now where it's around 30%. So it's mm. increased almost threefold 
in about 20 years. The Crazy. reliance on annual tax receipts on stocks, bonds, and real estate. And it's <laughs> even lately, it is even worse at the state and local government level mm -hmm. real estate. It is even worse. Oh, no doubt about it. I mean, just, just imagine all the, all the school taxes and everything else. It's just going to well, collapse. Well, did you, uh, especially for property taxes mm -hmm. and real estate agent sales and yep. people flipping homes, all those easy profits where people mm -hmm. were borrowing at cheaper interest rates and then flipping homes where people would make an easy hundred, more affluent people would make because they could borrow cheaper and then renovate homes and then flip them for an easy hundred or 200,000 because home prices, the narrative was home prices only go up. Those profits are gone. And, and when you look at a sector like that, I mean, it's very broad. It's nationwide. And there's so many people who are employed in that sector. Just think about all the people who work at home centers, the, the producers of uh, sheetrock and other building materials. The demand for all that will collapse as people stop flipping houses and stuff. It's, yes. And it's going to have think, an impact. Yep. Well, I think what will happen, and we've had on people, uh, or I've interviewed people like Cuppy and Josh Young and others, I think you will have a lot of the people that were in home construction, you'll have those people leave and they will go back to the oil service industry. So a lot of people in the Midwest and South that weren't involved in home construction because home prices were up and there was more demand for homes. And as long as home prices stayed high, you could keep building new homes mm -hmm. and expensive homes, or you could um, tear down. So you'd buy uh, expensive land, uh, like an old home here in the DC metro area. All right, and you put up, put up a nice McMansion. Exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. And then you could flip it once it was built, you could sell it for $1.5 million or more. And then um, you're buying the land for what, 800, 900 grand, and then building a McMansion on there and then selling the home for two million, uh, between 1.5 and 2 million. So you know, and, my, go ahead. Uh, my point was uh, the labor is probably going to go to oil services. Well, that assumes then that they're going to allow drilling here. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good point too. I mean, with with the government we have right now and the regulations, uh, it's not all that likely that we're going to see a lot of expansion in the oil drilling sector. You know, and, and talking about stocks and how things just kind of like go together. Uh, when FedEx warned their stock dropped twenty one percent, which was the uh, absolute worst one day performance for that stock since it was listed back in uh, the seventies, and um, Raj, the uh, CEO, said that uh, he's seeing volume declines in all sectors, and he talked about closing some ninety office locations of FedEx. Well, so, the costs are up a lot too. Yeah, and then but it's double whammy. But, so you have sales drop. You have the this is why stagflation is such a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon my French. This so you have sales dropping, like you said, but you also have cost rising. So it's like it's a worst case scenario. Oh, no doubt about it. So so now that they're going to be closing these offices and they're reducing the flight. So then the airports where they're flying out of, they're going to have reduced volume. They're going to make less money. They're probably going to have to let people go. I mean, it's it's just a downward spiral that we we enter. And then all the people who were employed at those 90 offices, I mean, they have to cut back. It just it just spreads like a big snowball rolling down a hill. And Wall Street, the Wall Street analysts that are covering the regular U.S. stocks, like so the Dow stocks, the S&P 500 companies, they're not adequate, adequately accounting for this. So they're probably going to say that the FedEx CEO jumped the gun. So they're mm -hmm. not adequately downgrading the earnings estimates for these large cap and medium cap companies that are publicly traded here in the United States, because Lee, at least for these large multinational companies, at least 20% of their annual sales, so their revenues are out of the European Union. So they're dealing with much higher costs. If they're an energy uh, business that uses a lot of fuel or electricity for manufacturing, they're dealing with much higher costs. You're looking at workers and this is not priced in yet. So speak, um, looking at comments from a lot of Wall regular Wall Street analysts that are not Austrian school or libertarian, they're warning that a lot of the CPI numbers, the consumer price index, one of the main reasons why the CPI numbers are stickier, which is the inflation is still staying, staying high, is not just because of energy and electricity costs, it's because of service costs going up. So you're seeing higher wages, higher labor demanding higher wages. People want to negotiate higher. So yeah, firms are firing. Yeah, some firms are cutting back and closing locations, firing workers, but the workers that do stay on board, they want higher wages. Of course, they, they need them. Everyone needs higher wages now because of inflation is so crazy. And I was telling you before the show, I've been buying, I drink tea in the morning and uh, I bought it just a few years ago and it was $11 a pound. 
uh, about a, six months ago I bought it. it was eighteen dollars a pound. It's almost thirty dollars a pound now in in less than half a year. It's the the inflation is, is just mind boggling. And this is Wiley that really and my buddy Aaron who does this week in charts. He's been doing it for over a year now. So congrats, Aaron. He's a brilliant analyst, fun, uh, a hidden gem. He was uh, underrated for many many years. I've known Aaron for over a decade. He's a really hardworking guy. So his show is great. He looks at all the different charts and sectors. You get a summary of all the different markets, a really good global macro summary. I would say basically a hedge fund level summary in under 20 minutes. This is something that we put out for free. So Aaron's Aaron has his own swing trading service. But there's really only two sectors right now, Lee, that seem to me to be doing well. You have the energy complex because of all the supply side issues. And these supply side issues, Lee, are not free market, are not capitalism. These these supply oh, side issues- Absolutely not. Of, yep, I agree. Yeah, These are because of bad policies yep. from politicians, bureaucrats, regulators, and they're creating enormous opportunities for these energy companies, whether they're oil, all these different companies in the oil sector, refiners, pipeline companies, oil and natural gas producers, liquefied natural gas companies, coal companies. You have uranium. Japan looks like they're going to have to restart because Japan is running, not running these enormous trade surpluses where they can recycle and buy as treasuries. They're having currency. Japan is a mess. <laughs> well, and a lot of this, I would make a good argument that a lot of this started because of inflation and stagflation and because of energy, because Japan and also consumer demands down a lot because of stagflation and inflation. So Japan's not able to run these enormous trade surpluses that they used to run in the past, but their energy mm -hmm. input costs are a mess. So you have the European Union with, with enormous energy input cost problems with, for energy and electricity. Every economy, every, develop, every modern economy, whether you're a developed country or a developing country, needs cheap energy, cheap electricity. Okay, ignore the nonsense that a lot of these hypocrites, these champagne socialist hypocrite politicians, the Davos crowd, while they fly in, while they fly in on their either uh, riding on their yachts or fly in on their private jets, and then oh, oh I bought carbon credits. Okay, <laughs> okay, I bought I bought carbon uh, on my private jet. Yeah, I bought carbon credits. Okay, ignore their nonsense. If you're going to run in a, a modern economy, you need cheap energy and cheap electricity. And Japan has had unbelievably high co rocketing costs for their energy and electricity, Germany, the European Union, and China and Asia. All of them are dealing, all these major manufacturing hubs. The United States is like one is an exception. The United States on a relative basis has very cheap energy and electricity costs, especially because of our natural gas advantage. Now, and could you imagine how inexpensive it would be if the government just let the market do what it needs to do here? There would be plenty of supply. So there, there's. Uh, I've talked about this in interviews. There's a lot of available oil and natural gas in the European Union landmass. It's just banned. Mm -hmm. So there's only a few major areas. Nor Norway is going to mint money. So Norway is going to mint money, increasing oil and natural gas production, liquefied natural gas, selling it to the European Union. So if the European Union doesn't want to buy from Russia, there the European Union is going to have to import from either Norway, an OPEC country, or from the U.S. Look by natural gas. Crazy times there, Jason. Let's well, talk about gold oh, and what's well, going well, on. Well, we uh, I didn't mention the other sector that's okay. doing the other sector. Aaron highlighted this in in um, his This Week in Charts, this past video that was released in the last 24 hours. So the other major sector, yeah, we have a bear market. It's clear bear market in pretty much every sec publicly traded sector and industry. Almost everyone except for energy. And this is the other one. It's market makers and yep, broker yep, dealers. Yep. So these are like your Charles Schwab's, your Fidelities, your interactive brokers. Um, E-Trade was bought, I think, by Morgan Stanley. But Morgan Stanley is an investment bank. I, I can't rem remember. They may have switched to the commercial bank and access to the discount window in 2009. A lot of those investment banks like Goldman Sachs and others did to yeah. get uh, to get uh, cheaper, cheaper capital. But my point, though, is with like these market makers and broker dealers. I mean, we have record amounts of asset price volatility and that benefits hedge fund people that benefits day traders. Yep. So, no doubt about it. 
So in a market like this, that is so reliant, that's very sensitive to any central bank or government policy announcing a rate hike, hike increase or the central bank, especially the Fed or the European... Just, just as a capitalist economy should work. <laughs> well, you're getting an argument here. I would argue, oh, excuse me, I would actually say that um, central banks are an antithesis. They're the oh, I, I was being sarcastic. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was being completely sarcastic. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, didn't didn't Lenin? I think there's a quote out there by Lenin saying that that a uh, central bank is required for a socialist government. Yeah, yeah. Well, they got to control the money, and they can create asset price boom and bust cycles. They can mm -hmm. they can mm -hmm. use, central banks facilitate. People don't understand this. They facilitate. They make the cancel on effect easier. So the central banks can pick and choose winners and losers. They can give artificially cheap currency and credit to whoever they want in the government. They, they can and they do. And, and I, I believe, Jason, that that's why we have fewer and fewer companies out there, because they get preferential credit and they could buy up their competitors. Oh, of course. Of yeah. course. If you're a large company and the Fed is buying your corporate bonds or the Fed is giving you access to cheaper capital, leverage buyouts, share buybacks, everything's just easier. Yep. No doubt. Than if you're an entrepreneur or a small business owner. Yeah. So there's really only, my point here, only two sectors right now that are doing pretty good to well. Almost all the other sectors and the earning, the Q3 earnings are not out yet, but the FedEx warning is serious. We're going to have big and bad surprises, especially because of cost increases and then also because of sales decline. So the worst of both worlds, Lee, double whammy coming up. Mm -hmm. And the Wall Street analysts have not downgraded these comp the sh uh, share price expectations for these companies. Of course not, because a lot of these Wall Street analysts- That's how they make their money. Well, also because like the Wall Street investment banks that are covering these shares have investment banking relationships with a lot of, of these course. companies yep. and they don't want to be overly bearish. Yeah, of course. So, like I said, that's how they make their money. You know, they, they, they have the investment banking relationships, but they're also, you know, selling the stocks through their brokers. Yep. So. And then you also have like the portfolio managers or the hedge funds that these investment banks are sponsoring. They're shorting the company stock. So while the stock analyst at the investment bank doesn't say too many negative things about the company, their, their actions where they're actually placing their capital and their bets are they're betting on the bear market to get worse, especially with these Fed rate hikes. So until the Fed rate says, until the Fed says that they're going to stop hiking rates and that quantitative tightening balance sheet reduction is over officially, the bear market's probably going to continue. And, you know, one, one thing along these lines, Jason, is if you are a large institutional investor invested in a particular particular company and you want to walk yourself out of that investment, you can't do it overnight because the amount of shares that you have will, would drive the, the, the price too much. So th they have to kind of like talk it down. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's all kind of a scam there, you know? Well, that's been going on for the last four or five, six months. Uh, Aaron has been covering this on his This Week in Charts videos. So every stock market rally, bear market rally that there was over the summer, the institutional investors were selling shares. So every course, rally, yeah. there it was sold. Yep, no, no doubt. You, you, in bear markets, you sell into rallies, you know? So, so you want to, let's talk about gold now, because I think that's a big story. Yeah, so there's a lot of interesting topics that are happening. Um, Fred, Fred Hickey actually just put out some tweets this week, some very interesting ones about the commitment of traders. Also, he highlighted that the gold premiums for physical gold in Shanghai are up to $40 an ounce. And Lee, we wanted to talk about how the manipulation works if you're a bullion banker or, or if you're like a Chinese wholesaler and you want to take advantage of this you can take advantage of the paper price manipulation. Heck, you could even hire the bullion banks to do it for you to smash the US dollar paper price. And you can go in there and if you're a bullion bank that's a custodian of say GLD, which is the official gold um, with the gold, e it's not an ETF, it's what the gold uh, trust. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a gold trust ETF, but you're not allowed to take, unless you're an official custodian, uh, which is a bullion bank, and there's a very tiny list. I think there's me under 10 bullion banks that are allowed to officially take delivery. So even if you're a large institutional investor and you own a lot of units of GLD, and I actually spoke to uh, friends who who um, 
new institutional investors who had over $100 million worth of units of GLD. So they were in the top 10 at one point. This was many years ago, and they still were not allowed to right, take right. delivery of physical gold. The bullion bankers told them to fuck off. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it, it's crazy. And, and you know, the the um, the vaults in Europe have been drained, I mean, or being drained, I should say. I, you know, I follow silver a little bit cl more closely than gold and uh, Colmex silver vaults. They're they're down to forty six million ounces. It's it's the lowest since uh, twenty eighteen. I mean, there's there's big demand coming out of Asia, uh, you know, China and and India as well for precious metals. So I wanted to talk about the manipulation and how it benefits certain entities. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to actually talk about numbers because I ran the numbers. So okay, if you're buying four hundred ounce bars, so those are like good Comex delivery bars, a four hundred ounce bar. It seems like a lot, but if you're if you're a jewelry wholesaler, you might buy a 400 ounce bar of physical gold and then melt it down into a bunch of different sure. types of jewelry, or you're going to recast that 400, you're going to send that 400 ounce bar, the good Comex delivery bar, you're going to send it to a Swiss refiner. The Swiss refiner is then going to recast that bar into uh, four nines kilo bars, and it's going to go into China. It's not going to come out. The profit potential for this type of paper price manipulation, if you smash it down in the US and then you're able to actually get gold if you're a bullion bank out of the COMEX, if you're on the custodian list for GLD, either out of the COMEX or out of GLD, raid GLD. And this has been happening for years, Lee. So if you can get physical gold bars, enormous ones, 400 ounce ones out of GLD, raid GLD, and then because you're affluent, a bullion bank, you can hire a cargo plane and you can have that gold shipped from either London or New York City and have it shipped to either a Swiss refiner or China. And you can capture that $40 an ounce premium. So let's say you bought that gold right around spot price. Let's say you rated GLD, you smashed the shit out of the paper price. You knew it was going down because you paid your bullion banker or you were the bullion banker, the market maker. You smashed that. You made money shorting it. You took delivery of the gold then. You shipped it to China and you captured that, that uh, $40 an ounce premium that it's mm -hmm. going for now in China. You would make an extra sixteen thousand dollars in capturing those premiums for every single four hundred ounce bar of gold. So imagine if you packed an entire cargo plane full of gold, millions of ounces. You're making a little bit more money that way. You're making millions of dollars extra <laughs> in in a couple weeks, couple months. Worth right, of work. right. So w you're without doing much, really. And the, well, if you're a bullion bank, right, you're probably already arranging these logistical trips mm -hmm, for, mm -hmm. for the metal to be shipped, but you're making extra yep. because the premiums in Asia, in China, and as I talked about in my last interview a couple of days ago with Brian McCarthy, who's a former China hedge fund manager and, has, and he uh, monitors China very closely. The Chinese investor has very limited investment options. Their housing bubbles collapsing. A lot of stocks in China are not doing well, especially technology companies are firing like crazy. The Chinese investor is being killed with stagflation in their real economy on food and energy and many other costs. There's talk, there's tons of printing there. Mm -hmm. Brian didn't talk about this, but there's tons of printing in China uh, to bail out their banks and save their banks from going insolvent. And real estate prices are still falling. So with limited investment demand and tons of capital controls. I mean, the Chinese investor, if you're fluent in China or a business owner in China, you have some savings and capital and you're worried about problems with the banks, banks failing, uh, an enormous currency devaluation of the Chinese yuan potentially coming, you're gonna buy physical gold and that's why the premiums are so high. So the paper price manipulation, it benefits select entities. I mean, you and me, we can't get delivery of the gold from GLD. We can't go. No. And, well, I can't. I couldn't afford to buy a bunch of four hundred ounce bars and arrange the logistics. But even if we could, we wouldn't be allowed to because we're not on the approved list. Yep, yep. I, I don't. I don't know if um, you, you followed the story about uh, someone trying to buy some silver off the Comex. <laughs> it was just such a nightmare to do. Um, they, they, I actually. They just, well, I know I know a money manager who tried to take delivery of one ton of physical silver from the COMEX. This was years ago, and they made him wait six months. Yeah, I'm not surprised. It's a crazy world, and for the individual investor, it's it's much more difficult than it is for the large institutional clients to to get things done.
but this just shows you how much of a joke the paper price actually is. Oh, no doubt. I mean, look, look at the move this past week. I mean, it was just slammed down. And and ironically, silver held up really well with, with that slam on gold. They usually trade pretty much in tandem, but not this time. But the physical demand for gold is actually exploding. We have, and I yep. talked about this in the last episode, like three or so weeks ago, we have five and a half year highs for demand for Swiss gold refiners exporting to mainland China. We now have a $40 an ounce premium in Shanghai. And with the paper gold price in US dollars, if it keeps getting smashed, I mean, the the arbitra- the manipulation, <laughs> arbitrage opportunities for the bullion banks, if you can raid GLD or raid SLV or get a COMEX contract delivered immediately, if you're a bullion bank, you can do it. If you're a bull- if you're regular, even hedge funds can't get their COMEX contracts delivered immediately. If you're a bullion bank, you can, and then you can get that cheap metal here in the U.S. in New York City or London delivered, and then you can ship it to a Swiss refiner or get it recast in mainland China and just capture enormous premiums. That's millions of dollars extra in profits off the paper price manipulation, moving the metal to China and reselling it there. Well, I, I think we covered everything that we wanted to cover, uh, Jason. It's been. Uh... Great discussion as always. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had better news to say. It's just unfortunately the market is so reliant on what the central banks are saying governments are doing. But I think energy is holding up pretty well. So unless energy prices crash, the energy stocks will continue to do very, very well. I think dividends for a lot of these energy companies are safe for now. Uh, That assumes energy prices don't crash, but there's actually a lot of oil and natural gas companies that are fairly well hedged. So I I think consumer staples will be pretty steady as well. For consumer, so historically in bear markets, Lee, consumer staple companies, so like toilet paper companies, Johnson and Johnson in the past. So basic consumer staples, staple companies, grocery stores, Costco, Target, Walmart, those things did well. What you have to watch for those if the company had too much inventory and their costs right. are rising yep, too much. Yep. Because if you have a scenario like FedEx where the company, their sales are collapsing, they have too much inventory and their costs are going up. And then they just, and then they're with uh, businesses, consumer businesses like Walmart or Target are going to have to deal with higher labor costs too. Yeah, but those, those are more, I think those are more along the lines of the consumer discretionary items like, you know, big screen TVs and backyard barbecues and and that sort I'm talking staples like toilet paper and food and and things like that. You still have supply chain problems and you still have costs. Oh, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Those will be passed on to the customer in the form of shrinkflation. So lower portion sizes and, and probably higher costs, but some of these costs cannot be passed on to the customer initially. So if the company cannot pass those on to the customer initially, the shares which some of these shares may not be normally that volatile, they could be down 10, 15, 20% with a bad earnings release pretty quickly. So this is the type of environment we have with stagflation, central banks threatening to uh, threatening to make things even worse. We're gonna have, I discussed this on my interview with the Liberty Lockdown podcast earlier this week. We're gonna have an environment until the Fed says that they're ending rate hikes, until the Fed says that they're ending quantitative tightening or balance sheet reduction, we're going to have a lot more volatility probably in all asset prices. If the dollar rallies, things are going to get a lot worse in the real economy. It's a global margin call. And it that's not going to change until, like I said, the Fed officially announces that their rate hikes are over and balance sheets are reduced. And because of this, this is going to benefit people who are not necessarily buy and hold investors and not necessarily... Um, betting on just one way. Or if they do have a bet, say long or short, they also have a hedge in place, a volatility hedge or some other type of hedge to protect themselves in case there's a unexpected move in another direction in a stock or interest rate or commodity. Sure. I I think to wrap this up, we just have to tell everyone, just be careful out there because picking winners and losers in this environment is very, very tricky. Well, also in an inflation environment like this, if you hold a lot of cash, and the mm-hmm. governments and central banks are still running inflation rates and devaluing it, your cash, the longer you hold the cash, it's going to be devalued too. So this is the or problem so. with bear markets, especially when there's inflation and stagflation involved. So in a deflationary bear market, if you held cashly, your cash would be gaining purchasing power. There'd be cheaper asset prices to buy. So, but not an inflationary environment. 
yeah, we still have a lot of inflation and stagflation in the supply chain. There's still there there will be most likely even worse commodity problems and supply side problems in the future. So if we do have like base metal miners and fertilizer companies and other other and other commodity producers dealing with much higher costs and supply chain problems, and capital's not available for a lot of these miners, there's going to be a lot of supply coming offline in the next 12 to 24 months if commodity prices don't rally in the and interest rates continue to go up. So we could have, again, we could have sh much shorter cycles of only two or three years where we have asset prices down, commodity futures down for the next six months, and then we have another big rally again in commodities. And it's just going to, the average person out there, it's going to be unbelievably difficult because of the volatility, the up and down moves in the asset prices, the up and down move in commodities. But that's the new normal we have now mm -hmm. because of how reliant all these asset prices are on government and central bank policies. Absolutely. Well, Jason, thank you so much again. Appreciate the discussion. Excellent. And again, this is episode number nine of Finance on Spun. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like and subscribe and take a look at my Patreon. There's a bunch of articles, almost 250 articles behind the paywall for only $5 a month. You have great content there, and uh, I hope everyone watches my new video on risk.